Hi, this is Town Advice of Supervisor Angie Carpenter welcoming you to another edition of Supervisor Spotlight. And uh, today, uh, the focus of what we're going to talk about is Mental Health Awareness Month. May is Mental Health Awareness Month. Hopefully, uh, this will be running longer than that because we hope to share some information because the issue and the problems of, of mental health that we're experiencing are not going to go away. And um, so today, I'm delighted to be joined by David Vizzini, who is the Senior Director of Residential Services for Outreach, and Catherine Dickin, uh, who is a social worker at Good Samaritan Hospital. So welcome to both of you. Thank you so much for making the time to be here. And hopefully, um, at the end of what we're going through here today will be a positive uh, experience for those who are listening and watching. Um, you know, we in the town, in the county of Suffolk, there are many, many uh, opportunities for help. And uh, we will be posting those uh, agencies and that information uh, on as we're talking today. But also, too, you can go to the town's website, islipny.gov, and get all of that information. So, uh, David, I want to start with you. Certainly the pandemic that we've been through these last two years, and uh, unfortunately now it seems to be spiking again, has wrought havoc in a number of areas, but certainly in people's mental health. And from what we're hearing and seeing, women have been more adversely impacted and young people. So from your you know, part of the world, what are you seeing? Well, first off, Angie, thank you for having us on. We really appreciate it. Um, so at Outreach, we've seen a large increase. I mean, obviously, if you go back to uh, 2020 when we had the shutdown, it was difficult to get services. Um, you know, people were sheltering in place, and, you know, not a lot of community-based things were available. Um, and, you know, fast-forwarding to today, even though the things are open, and, um, and as the virus is spreading again at a, at a high rate, good news is hospitalizations are still down, right? So at least we have that. Right. But I think what we've seen is, again, that people have really not fully adapted back or have accepted the new normal. Um, and I think that where we've seen increases, definitely with women um, and young women and adolescent girls. Um, uh, we run residential programs at Outreach in New York City and Long Island, and we actually have more girl admissions into residential and to our outpatient programs than ever before over the last two years. Mm -hmm. uh, we're seeing a spike. We're also seeing a spike in people, you know, progressing in prescription drug use uh, because of access. And then also we're seeing the uptick, obviously, in the marijuana usage as well. Mm -hmm. And people are turning to drugs for coping because they don't know how to deal with the stressors that they're facing. Um, focusing specifically on adolescents. Um, outreach specializes in outpatient residential care for adolescents. On Long Island has many programs in the town. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we really noticed is, is that adolescents are really struggling with coping socially. They just don't know how to socialize in healthy ways in person. And then how they socialize, you know, which I know is a topic for later about, you know, through social media, um, is seeming to be very inappropriate. And then so we well, have this big let, Let's yeah. just, let's stop right there sure. because I think that, and Catherine, I'm sure that you can attest to that also, when you say social media and young people especially not having social skills, I can't tell you how many times I've been in a restaurant and you see a family sitting there, mom and dad and the two kids, and everybody is sitting there with their phone. You know, uh, are they texting each other? <laughs> you know? Sometimes. Uh, I mean, they're not, they're not communicating even in a setting like that over a meal. Uh, and it seems from what we've seen and heard that social media for all of its positives has really wrecked havoc with society in many, many ways with an increase in bullying. Um, you know, I don't know if in your world as a social worker, Catherine, you're seeing that absolutely yeah so um, yeah I mean do you have people coming into the hospital that you're working with along those lines um, yes um, so you know in the emergency department we do um, manage a lot of crisis intervention and 
Um, definitely across the board, we are seeing an impact on a lot of individuals regarding social media or just the phone use in general. They might not even necessarily be on social media website, but um, you know, there's a lot of instant gratification that's involved in how we access any material that we need now or you know where we're getting our resources from so um, like you were saying um, probably the largest percentage of that that we're seeing right is with the adolescent mm -hmm. age group um, the adults are struggling with the, the social media as well um, but definitely the adolescents who have grown to be more dependent on it um, are having almost crisis moments when it's not available. Um, yeah. You know, it's interesting. We have uh, an opioid and uh, drug abuse task force in the town of Islip, chaired by Marianne Pfeiffer from Youth Enrichment Services and uh, Drew Scott, formerly of News 12, who lost a daughter, uh, a granddaughter, to drug overdose but uh, one of the strategies that they were looking at employing especially for this month in raising awareness is getting young people to sign a pledge to not engage in any social media for a week mm -hmm. and I, I just don't know how successful you know we're going to be because that truly is a challenge for some of these young people and uh, you know I go back to your one of your first words David when you said uh, social skills and not having, you know, those situations, young people especially don't seem to be comfortable, you know, Correct. in a social situation, and that that really doesn't speak well for our future. I don't think. Well, I think what happens too is is that we have to understand that the world has changed. You know what I mean? And you know, I'm raising young kids. I have a 12 year old, 11 year old, and a nine year old. Oh, right? 12, that's so, a tough age. <laughs> so, you I know, you also. and I think, thank you. <laughs> and I think, you know, one of the things that me and my wife really had to understand was, is, is that there are a tremendous amount of social pressures mm -hmm. for kids. Like, you know, two out of my three kids have phones, so the youngest doesn't, you know what I mean? And that was a lot of pressure by them and society for those age groups to have phones. But one of the things that we do is that they don't have the same level of access that their friends do for social media, and we get plenty of grief about oh, that. Oh, I'm certain. So, but it's really about, you know, the parents and the young people understanding how to manage it appropriately. Because if you take the approach with young people, the answer is no. Then they're just going to find ways to do it, and they're going to keep it from you. If you just give them the whole boat, they're going to, they don't have the skills, right. they don't have the self-awareness in order to manage themselves. So really what we need to find and really help is parents with young people help them manage their children's use of socialization through social media, but also promote interpersonal skills and communication with their peers in person because I think that we have to manage both of those things for children to really develop into the healthy human beings that they're going mm -hmm. to be. But again, I do think that social media, technology is such a big part of our life. I mean, look at us here now. Yep. Right? Yep. So I think we have exactly. to embrace that. Uh, you know, listening to what you said about parents, um, I have two grandchildren. Uh, one granddaughter who's 20 and a grandson who's eight. And I know with the eight-year-old in particular, his parents just recently told me how they've uh, sort of restricted his use of electronic media in any way, shape, or form, whether it's you know his iPad or whatever. He's limited to a certain amount of time that he can use it uh, over a given day. And uh, so we'll go into that a little bit more. We're going to take a little break here on Supervisor Spotlight. Uh, thank you so much again, David and Catherine, for being with us. And we'll be right back. You are watching ITV, Channel 18, Islip Television. This is Angie Carpenter, Town of Islip Supervisor, here today uh, talking about mental health issues 
as May is Mental, Mental Health Awareness Month. And with us, we have David Vizzini of Outreach and Catherine uh, Dickin from Good Samaritan Hospital, who's a social worker and uh, deals with the public, you know, seeing them when they come in through the emergency department. Um, I think it's important to note at Good Sam, you have a segregated pediatric uh, emergency department. And with the modernization program that's going to be happening at Good Sam, uh, you know, that's an exciting 300,000 yes. square foot addition, but they're expanding the ER and making every, you know, single person is going to have more separate space Correct. than is there now. So that, that'll yeah. make everyone's life a little easier and hopefully, not hopefully, but I know will produce more positive outcome for those that come to the facility. I think so. Yeah. But, um, so we're digressing. But back to the issue of mental health and how it was exacerbated so by COVID, um, especially with women and young people. Um, and we talked a little bit about social media. But I also, um, there's got to be warning signs. You know, we, we hear about the horrific things that happen like we just experienced with the shooting at the supermarket in Buffalo. God you know, rest the souls of those people that, you know, lost their lives. Uh, but there were warning signs. And, and what are some of those warning signs? You know, what, what do you see in the ER when someone's coming in that maybe says to you, uh-oh, this person really needs help? Yeah, um, there, are, there are definitely warning signs. Um, and very often it's not just things that we're observing and somebody who's coming in with a crisis, but reports from family members or people who are close to them, which kind of gets back a little bit to the increased difficulty of the social connections because sometimes it could be harder to recognize behavior changes in a loved one or a friend when you're solely communicating or mostly communicating through text yes, message yeah, gotcha. or mm -hmm. social media or mm -hmm. you know there is a little bit of um you know a piece that we are missing now um that really gets to know somebody and their personality and you know so it, it can be a little harder to identify those kinds of things um, but things that we do look for are that we observe are um obviously behavior changes for somebody that uh, you know maybe you um, typically know them to be a very uh, relaxed or calm kind of person or um, is able to cope and you know maybe now they're, they're more agitated maybe mm -hmm. they're a little bit more belligerent um, you know something's kind of off with them um, and then that goes along with a, maybe a personality change so um, and that could go either way so for somebody that um, you think is generally a positive person or very outgoing or very chatty is now suddenly withdrawing or isolating themselves or not talking as much. Um, and then on the opposite side, maybe you do know somebody who does kind of struggle a little bit with being positive. Um, maybe they have a little depression that they have shared. And then all of a sudden, mm -hmm this light switch goes on and they're just, they're elated, they're happier. That's, that could be a warning t sign too, sometimes that they've sort of made a decision. So if I'm hearing you right, uh, you know, drastic changes in what you know a person to be uh, should be a wake up call, a warning sign. And I'm sure that, you know, from a family perspective, it's probably difficult sometimes to accept the fact that maybe the person is a little off uh, yes. so so you know David what you, you must deal with families all the time and people don't just come into the facility sign themselves in and then you don't hear you know deal with families so what are some of the, the things that you can you know share with us that would help sure so I mean as you can imagine as a parent it is very difficult to look at your child and say like you know there's something wrong you know what I mean? And the first thing parents do is they blame themselves. Yeah. And, they, and they want, you know, you want your child 
to be perfect. Yep. You want everything in their life to be perfect. Well, you want it they. always to be better than it was for right. you, you know? Something that I remind parents that I work with is, is that, you know, growing up is a process. You know what I mean? And no one grows up at the same rate. And I think that that's very, very important, you know? And parents tend to compare their children to their, their other children. They're, they compare the second child to the first and the third right. to the second and so yeah. on and so forth. And it makes it difficult for them to really see them, their children as individuals, um, you know, stand alone. And that's normal. Mm -hmm. And again, from a parenting standpoint, that's normal. From an adolescent development standpoint, that's normal. I think what's important is, is that you gotta advocate for your kids and you can't be afraid to get them help and services. Schools have a ton of mental health services, starting in elementary, that is paid for by the school and paid for by the state. Do you find, and I think I've seen this, that because of COVID, there's more of an acceptance of the utilization of mental health services and more available, especially through the schools, Absolutely. that they're adding counselors where they might not have had them before. Yes, I mean a lot of the federal funding that's come down through the you know to the state, to the county, mm -hmm. to the town, you know, right. saying has been very very helpful with regards to school districts, hospitals, other institutions. You know what I mean? In providing mental health services to all age groups, you know, the elderly, adults, young adults, adolescents, and that's been crucial, you know, to combat all of the mental health related issues that have come up, you know, because of COVID, but there were tons of issues before COVID. Oh, sure. So, you know, I just think that, you know, yeah, but yeah. I think COVID has allowed us to really put the spotlight on it because I think that one of the things that's a real powerful message that a lot of people in the, the field of mental health services talk about is that what the world felt for a year or two, you know what I mean, they're still feeling on some level, mm -hmm. is what people who suffer with mental illness feel all the time yeah. for, Oh, that, that's really a good way to look at it, that sense of isolation and, sure. you know, uh, I think as human beings we tend to think that what we're going through is unique to us, nobody else had to deal with this, etc. Yeah, yeah. so, it's, so it's, it's very, very powerful. I think that overall the main thing is to try to be self-aware and try to be aware of your children, your loved ones. Um, because that sense of awareness and just talking about it, just having open right. communication, non-judgmental, hearing people out is really, really important. You know what I mean? And offering the help when they're ready. You know what I mean? Just right. be supportive. Being, do not be judgmental. Don't make it about you. It's about them. Help them help themselves. And that's really the key. And believe me, you know, the support is the biggest thing. And the communication. So you said having those conversations. Mm -hmm. And again, the social media comes into it because if they're sitting there with their, you know, phones or their iPads or whatever, you know, texting or yeah. or instant messaging their friends, you know, they're not likely to have that conversation. So, you know, a parent or a loved one has to be able to say, hey, you know, put it down. Let, let's let's really talk. Let's really and one, and one of the biggest obstacles of what it comes across is that because of social media, because there's the wide access of people that you can communicate with, you're not communicating with people that are seeing you in person or in your everyday life. Okay, yes. so again, communication, and we're going to come back uh, after another little break. Um, I know that uh, Catherine said it too, and uh, David certainly, so we will be back on Supervisor Spotlight. You are watching ITV, Channel 18, Islip Television. Welcome back to Supervisor Spotlight. I'm Angie Carpenter, Town of Isop Supervisor, and we're delighted to be here today with David Vizzini of Outreach and Catherine Dickin from Good Samaritan Hospital, who's a social worker there, uh, talking about some of the mental health issues that we're facing as May is Mental Health Awareness Month. And when we left to take a break, we started talking about communication and having those conversations. And uh, during the break, Catherine was sharing some of those strategies for those conversations that don't always happen when you decided as a parent or a loved one that you're going to have that conversation, let's sit down and talk. It can happen when it happens and you've got to be open to it. Right. 
Right. Yeah, so, you know, lots of times as, as parents, um, you know, we, we just have this urge, even if we think that something is off or if we just want to learn a little bit more about what our kids might be going through, we have an urge to sort of prompt them and, and say, you know, how was your day or how was school or, um, and you'll find that you get kind of a very bland or guarded answer. Mm -hmm. It was fine, nothing happened, nothing exciting happened, you know. Um, so in prompting kids, um, especially the adolescent age group, and you're, you're putting, you're trying to get them to open up on your own timeline, it just doesn't happen that way. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying don't ask your kids questions. Of course, ask them questions. You want them to know that you're, you're thinking about what they might be going through. But a lot of those moments happen in the unstructured time and the random moments when you're just on a car trip or you're driving somewhere or you're sitting in traffic um, and your child might see something and it reminds them of something that happens. And all of a sudden, they're talking about something that happened in school two weeks ago and you're thinking to yourself, why didn't you tell me about that? Mm -hmm. Don't say that, you know, let it roll. Um, you know, so it's really about those unstructured moments when they open up that you don't want to shut them down. You don't want to say, well, we'll come back to that. Um, I've had moments with my own kids where I've pulled over, you know. Um, and again, adults are guilty of it too. If your child has a moment where they're starting to talk to you about something and you're on your phone, that shuts them down mm -hmm. also. Um, so everybody has to kind of be mindful of, you know, ways of, of interacting without the phones and, and talking and taking advantage of those moments that pop up. That, that's so true. I, you know, when you talk about the fact it's not just kids that, you know, abuse social media and maybe are a little disrespectful in how they use their time when they're with others. I've been in a meeting where you're having right. a conversation on a topic and then someone's sitting there and they're looking down at their phone and they're texting and I'm like, you know, you want to say, uh, excuse me, you know, let's all like just put our phones down and let's pay attention to the subject at hand. And, uh, you know, it's really, really tough. It, as I said earlier, there are so many benefits to social media, but it's caused this whole different level uh, of angst uh, in many, many ways. Yes. Um, you know, David, tell me, Right now, you said there's a lot more women and young people coming in. Typically, what happens during a stay there? So with the women, um, what will end up happening is that somebody will come in who is just finishing up like a hospital stay or some type of a, uh, acute stabilization, right? So what will happen is they'll be in the hospital because they've had some type of issue or outburst or you know spike in their mental health. Well, they could even be off a suicide attempt. Um, you know, and then what all the happening is the hospital do a wonderful job stabilizing them, get them on the medication, or just you know, give them resources and intense services at the moment. And then what that's outreach provides that's, that's what we do. exactly. <laughs> that's what you mean. So, um, so then what outreach does is is that we provide rehabilitation as well as reintegration services for men and women who are adults um, that help them you know learn life skills, learn healthy coping skills, learn them how to deal with a lot of them are using substances, you know, alcohol, illegal drugs, marijuana, so on and so forth, and where they need to learn to manage that, right? Mental health is stabilized, but the drug use is not. So we help them with those pieces. Um, and that's a big key. And again, so we have the two phases. One is rehabilitation, which is kind of like a teaching phase, you know, where we're teaching mm -hmm. them all the skills they need to do. And then we do the reintegration phase, where they go back out into society, live a life um, in the community, but you know, spend and give them that opportunity right. to still connect yep. with you, that lifeline, yep. if you will, yep. and stay with us. Yeah. And then for the kids, you know, we provide um, residential services where we're doing everything under the sun. You know, pedi pedi pediatric care. We're doing mental health care. We're providing schooling on site. You know, we're doing everything for them because the kids. A lot of times, what will happen is that you know, and Catherine talked about it. Like they see a lot of people in the hospital. Okay, but. Young people, if we don't remove them from their environment for a short period of time, they really don't ever stabilize. They just kind of go mm -hmm. right back into it yeah. and that immersed world that they live in. So much stimulus, so much things facing them. So what we find is, is that whether it's substance use, mental health, or both, 
we find that if someone is struggling with their mental health or substance use, to have them come into a short residential placement uh, where their families are very much involved, because like, there's a stigma, right, in residential adolescent care where like they don't see their families. They see their families every week. Mm -hmm. There's family counseling, group family counseling, individual. They go on visits at home. It's very, very important to have the right. family the involved. The whole dynamic. Yes, yeah, absolutely. But well, you know, you, you said the word stigma, and I'm sorry to interrupt, no, but no. I want to hopefully get out of this today the fact that mental health is like if you have a backache you don't ignore it if you right. you know have a stomach ache you don't ignore it yep. whatever your knees bothering you go have somebody check it and find out you had arthritis whatever the issue is but there shouldn't be a stigma yep. mental health is all part of our our entire psyche and there are times that you're going to be a little challenged and you're going to have an issue and there's nothing wrong with getting help Absolutely. you know and that's where professionals like Catherine and David come in and uh, I'm hoping that you know we've done that here today the fact that you know they're able to come back to you or stay connected with you to be that lifeline going forward the town has a, a plethora of services for adults adolescents through hospital to rehab through outpatient services mm -hmm. and you know hopefully that, that people will reach out on the website and take a look and you know, because I do think that there are the resources are there. We just need people to access them. I know it's difficult to ask for help, but you know, please do. And places like Outreach and Good Samaritan and so on and so forth will be there yeah. for anyone who needs it. And I think um, the fact that the services are there, those that the loved ones, there's where you can really intervene and and really guide them. You know, maybe you're going to have to make the phone call. Maybe you're going to have to set up the appointment but encourage them to get the help because you care, you know? I used to say to my kids uh, when they were growing up and, uh, you know, had to discipline them for something, I always said that's the price you pay when somebody loves you. Yeah. You know, that they care about you and, you know, care enough to direct you and, and help you when you need it, even if you don't realize it yourself. So um, I just want to thank you both for being here today. Um, Again, it is, it's a big issue. Uh, don't want to keep harping on COVID, but you know, it's a reality. It is. And uh, you know, some of the, the negatives that we've had to endure because of it, I think there are some positives. And focusing on the issue of the importance of mental health, I think is something that we might not have done had it not been for what we endured with COVID. So, um, David, thank you so much. Well, uh, you. you and everyone, your team at Outreach do a wonderful job. And certainly, Catherine, uh, Good Samaritan Hospital is no stranger to us in the town of Iceland. Right. You guys do a great job. And thank just you. urge everyone to go to the website, iceldny.gov, or to Outreach, or to Good Sam, or any of the plethora of agencies and institutions that are out there to offer that, that help, that mental health to keep us, you know, totally healthy as a whole person. So I thank you for joining us on Supervised Spotlight.